We're continuing in our series in the first two chapters of the book of Luke as we celebrate Advent, as we look forward uh, towards Christ's coming that we celebrate at Christmas time. So we're in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. If you want to go ahead and uh, grab your copy of God's Word and turn there with me, Luke chapter 1, verse 46. As you turn there, I'd like to uh, take a little poll, a little survey this morning. And I know the kids are with us. It's a family sit together uh, weekend for the holidays. And so I would like everyone to participate, including the kids, in this survey. So I'm going to give you two options, and you can only vote for one. So you have to choose one, okay? Uh, I'm about to give you two options, and it is based on your preference uh, for the Sunday morning service, okay? We aren't a church that votes on things, so your vote counts for nothing, just to be clear. Uh, just kind of an informal poll here. So uh, if you prefer the music over the sermon, raise your hand. If you prefer the music time more than the sermon time, please be bold. Raise your hand. I'm right there with you. It depends on the day. It depends on the day. I get that. <laughs> yep. I get that. It depends on the day. It depends on a lot of things. But I count about five of us. So let's go ahead and just for the sake of the exercise, raise your hand if you prefer the sermon portion of the morning service. I think we just learned something about our church, right? For some of us, this may have been a surprise, but for many of us, it was not. And um, this maybe says something about you, maybe it doesn't, because there's a lot of reasons that we have preferences uh, about the morning or the evening worship service. Um, it can be based on our um, personality. It can be based on our gifting. Maybe some of us just aren't really a great singer. We're not really a musical person. It can be based on our tradition. Uh, it can be ba based on what church was like for us when we were a kid, or if church is a new thing for us. There's a lot of preferences that go into play here. But we take this uh, survey this morning because what we're about to see in scripture is a song, as uh, Zach mentioned earlier, a song of Mary, where she is bursting out into song, singing about a number of things. And as we take a look at this, we want to try to answer the question, what is Mary singing about? What is causing her to sing? For some of us, whether we prefer the music or the sermon may be based on preference and a lot of factors. But if we're honest, for some of us, we're not really sure what the fuss is all about. We're not sure what people are singing about. We're not sure what people are getting all emotional about. We usually think about the music time as the emotional part of the service. Well, today we're taking a look at God's word to see what Mary was so excited about, what caused her to burst out into singing. Would you pray with me and for me as we get started here this morning? Heavenly Father, we come to you and uh, we want to worship you with our words, with our singing, with our time in your word, and even with how we love one another. Father, would you speak to us now? Would you communicate to us what you want to say to each one? Father, we come to you expectant, believing that you have something you want to say to us this morning. God, we thank you that you have already been speaking to us this morning. Through our time of singing, through our love for one another, even nature pours forth speech about who you are, God. We want to continue to hear from you now. We want to hear from your word. We want to hear from your spirit. We want to hear from your people today. Father, would you... Take my humble, feeble words and use them to show who you are, Father. Spirit, we pray that you would do your work of magnifying, of pointing a spotlight on Christ and what he has done for us. He is the theme of heaven's praises. He is the one who is worthy of our praise here this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you turn to Luke chapter 1, we'll take a look at the scripture. I'll read it for us. We'll talk about it a little bit and then talk about some implications from the text. If you think back to last week, Pastor Brooks talked about um, how Mary heard this from the angel that she would be with child and her, though a virgin, never being with a man, she would become pregnant by a miracle of God and that she would give birth to the Savior. She would give birth to the Messiah. And when she heard these things, we looked at Luke 1.38, where she says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be 
to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. There is a picture of humility here. Mary says three things in verse 38. Behold, behold, take note of who God is. Stop and look at who God is. I am a servant, the bond servant, the slave of the Lord. And let it be to me according to your word. That's a very picture of humility. Let it be according to your word. This is another way of saying, not my will, but yours be done. That was Mary's response to hearing this news. We learn from this verse that she was a person submitted to the will of the Father. And we learn even more about that in Mary's song this week. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. So let's take a look at this. In the first three verses, 46 through 48, we learn a few things. The first thing that we learn is that in verse 47, Mary is looking forward to a savior. Obviously, Mary is the mother of Jesus. Jesus is not yet born during this time. Usually we think about Jesus in the flesh being called the savior. Here we see that she is looking forward and she is rejoicing in God who is her savior. She is looking to God to be her savior, to provide a way, to pay for her sins. She knows that her only way to be made right with a holy God is through the work of a savior. She is rejoicing in God and calling him her savior, even though Jesus has not come yet in the flesh. The next thing that we notice is that uh, this prayer that she is praying is not just a song that she is coming up with at the spur of the moment. It is not just a song that she heard on the radio. She is coming with a host of Old Testament passages that she is mixing into this song. One commentator said that it is a collage of the entire Old Testament. It's not just a few verses that we can count. It's an actual collage of the Old Testament. Parts of it you can even lay on top of Hannah's prayer from 1 Samuel. And there's quotes from Hannah's prayer. We learn from this that Mary grew up in a faithful Jewish family. She's not just coming up with these things as an emotional response. She's not just talking about the way she feels. She is singing about the things that she knows to be true of God, and she knows those things from his word. A faithful Jewish family would teach these things and pass them on to their children. In Genesis chapter 18, we see the Lord tell Abraham, I have chosen you that you may command your children and your household after him, after you, you keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring you what has been promised. In Deuteronomy 6, particularly verse 4, every Jewish child by the age of three, basically by the time they can speak and articulate and remember things, they have this memorized. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then in that same passage, there's instructions to the parents, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. We see the author of Proverbs chapter 3 say, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. We see throughout scripture this command to teach your children the scriptures. And Mary knows the Old Testament scriptures. Her picture of God has been informed by what the Old Testament has taught her about who God really is. 
Next, we see in these first three verses that Mary believes that there is a blessing for humility, a blessing that comes with lowliness. She says, my soul, my very being magnifies the Lord. This word magnifies also shows up in Matthew 23, but it shows up in a negative sense. When Jesus is talking about the Pharisees who like to pray in front of the people, who like to, it to be known that they are fasting, they like it to be known that they are holy, that they are pious, that they are doing the right thing, and it says that they enlarge the tassels on their clothes. It's that same word, magnify or enlarge. Mary is using it in the opposite way, the correct way here. When we hear the word magnify, sometimes we get the wrong impression because when we use the word magnify, we're typically talking about taking something that is small and trying to make it look big. That's not what we're talking about here. When we say we magnify the Lord, when Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, she does not say, God, you are small and I want to make you look big. Our worship, our feeble songs, our prayers, they could never make the holy, mighty, just God of the universe look bigger than he actually is. In fact, they pale in comparison. Our words fail us to communicate who he really is. So what she is saying is, uh, my soul, my very being is drawn in attention. It's drawing attention to who God is. The Pharisees wanted to draw attention to themselves. They wanted to magnify, enlarge, make themselves look better than they were. Mary is saying, my soul is attention. My attention is on the Lord. She sees that her lowliness, her humility, brings about blessing. It points to a Savior. It points to a Father in heaven. She calls herself the servant, the bondservant, the slave of the Lord. Let's move on to verse 49 and 50. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. If you're underlining things in your Bible there, in verse 49, you can underline mighty. And then the word holy and then in verse 50, the word mercy. She is getting a picture of who God is from the Old Testament. That he is mighty, that he is holy, and that he is merciful. Now let's think about these for just a moment. What if God is just mighty? What if God is just mighty, but he's not holy and he's not merciful? Well, two things. One, he is like many other concepts of God in the world. Uh, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, every people that has had a belief or a God about them says something about God being mighty. So if God is just mighty, it doesn't differentiate him from all the other ideas of God. The other thing is that if God is just powerful, just mighty, that may or may not go okay for us. We're kind of at his whim. Let's look at the second part is uh, the aspect of him being holy. What if God is holy? What if God is holy, but he's not merciful? Well, then we're in real trouble. Because we can't have anything to do with a holy God because you and I are not holy. So a holy God cannot have anything to do with us. In fact, in the Old Testament, we see people approach his holiness, holiness in a, uh, an impure way, and they die on the spot. What if God is merciful, but he's not powerful? What if God cares deeply about us and he wants to be merciful and gracious towards us, but he just can't do it? Well, then that's not much help to us. But no, Mary here has a picture of the Lord from his word from the Old Testament that he is powerful, he is holy, he is merciful. And then she says that his faithfulness is from generation to generation. She knows she comes from a long line of people that have received mercy and might from the Lord. You have been faithful from generation to generation. This week, there's a probability that you had lunch with some people, supper with some people that you were related to for the holidays. And if you're like me, 
it never quite goes exactly according to plan, right? I don't know about you, but I have this like Norman Rockwell painting in my head where everything's gonna go just right and everything's gonna be great, the food's gonna be perfect, we're all sitting around the same table. I ended up at the kids' table this year. <laughs> and I'm not kid table size. But that's just what had to happen because the two-year-old was either gonna eat with me or dump it on the floor. So I sat with the two-year-old all the way to like family members that take a little bit of extra grace required to love on them. There's one in every family, you know, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a, a sibling even, that just takes a little bit of extra grace around the holidays to love on them. If you can't think of who that is, <laughs> might be you. So just a warning there. Holidays are a picture. <laughs> The, the generations have not necessarily been faithful to the Lord. Our family tree is one that is jagged and broken due to our sin. Our family tree is broken because we're in it. Our family tree is broken not because the generations, because the generations have not been faithful. And when Mary looks back at her family tree, she does not see a generation of faithfulness. What she sees is a God who has been faithful throughout all generations. Faithful to a people that did not deserve it. Faithful to a people whose family tree was broken. That's what she is worshiping God for here in this song. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. This is God's power put in human terms. The mighty arm, the literal arm of God has shown his mighty power. This is used in the Old Testament in two different ways. One, in providing for God's people, parting the Red Sea, providing for them with his outstretched arm. And then the other way that his outstretched arm is seen in the Old Testament is when he is defeating his enemies. Mary is saying that God has provided with the strength of his arm, but he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. First thing that we note here is that pride starts in the heart. Pride starts in the heart. And James 4, 6 says this is a problem because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I'll break it down here. What Mary is saying is the proud are swept away while the humble are provided for. The proud are swept away by the pride that is in their hearts, but the humble of the heart receives blessing, provision, mercy, and grace from God. That's what Mary is singing about here. Verse 52 and 53, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and he exalt, has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. She is saying something in these two verses as well throughout the whole song. She is saying that God's provision, his mercy, his might, his power have, has been seen for her as an individual, but also for God's people and even for all of mankind. It's personal, but it's profound. It's individual, but it's corporate and even global. That's what she's celebrating and singing about here. And in fact, this song that she is singing has a progression where it starts with personal. My soul magnifies the Lord. I rejoice in God, my Savior. But then it moves on to national, his faithfulness for the generation of the Jewish people that Mary came from. And then it turns global, talking about the Abrahamic covenant and how God will bless all people through Abraham. There's a progression of God's salvation and his work among his people. And then she even looks ahead to salvation and the coming of God's kingdom to come in the future. As we read verse 53, where she says, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This should remind us of one of the stories that we read about and talked about in our Momentum series, which the rich man that comes to God, the rich man who comes to Jesus and he says, I followed all of your rules. I've kept it from birth. How can I be right with you? How can I be in the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, you lack one thing. Take all that you have and give it away and come follow me. And scripture tells us that the man walked away very 
sad because he was extremely rich. It's a fulfillment of what Mary is saying the kingdom of God will be like. There are other examples of this uh, for the sake of time and the impending blizzard. I'm going to refer you uh, to the app on our app. You can download the notes. You can take a look at the notes that I am looking at right here in front of me. And on that, um, I've listed all of these New Testament passages uh, that Jesus tells a parable or teaches about the kingdom of God. And there's aspects of this idea in verse 53. He's filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. When our hearts come to him in a humble estate, hungering and thirsting for his righteousness, is when we walk away filled. This is the values of the kingdom of God. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Here she is not just saying that she is a slave, a bondservant to the Lord, but that Israel, his people, are set aside for his purposes, his servant. And she says that God remembers something and it causes him to reach out and help his people. He remembers something. Does he remember their faithfulness? Does he remember their piety, their holiness, their religious deeds? Does he remember that they prayed a prayer when they were a child? Does he remember that they have gone to church? No, let's look at what the text says. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. It's in remembrance of his mercy that he has helped his people. And in verse 55... In verse 55, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Mary is thinking back to the Abrahamic covenant with this language. In Genesis 15, we see God make a covenant with Abraham. God is going to choose a group of people set aside for his purposes to communicate who he is to the world, but also for the Messiah to come through one day. And Abraham is the father of that nation, of the Jewish people. And in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And he, there's two parts to the covenant. The first one is he tells Abraham to look up at the stars of the sky. And he says, your offspring will be more, more numerous than the stars that you see tonight. And then in that covenant, Abraham receives mercy and righteousness is granted to him. It's nothing that he earns. And in fact, during the covenant ceremony, God is doing the commitment and Abraham has fallen into a deep sleep. So this is the two parts of the Abrahamic covenant that Mary is thinking back to. She is saying that this savior that is promised to come from her womb is the one that has been promised from the very beginning. In fact, it's not God's backup plan, but it has been his plan from the beginning. And even before Abraham, even before Genesis 15, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we see God make a promise to Adam and Eve, the very first two people, that he would provide the defeat of their enemy, Satan, that he would be, provide a savior that would come and defeat Satan once and for all, that he would provide one that would make a relationship with a holy God possible. And Mary is thinking back about the faithfulness of God to provide the Messiah, the savior that was promised so many generations ago. This is something that all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as they write the story of Jesus, the narratives about the life of Jesus, this is something that they do as well. They go back to God's promise and God's covenant and God's faithfulness for generations. In the gospel of Luke, he starts with Adam and talks about Adam and, and goes through the lineage starting with Adam. He's saying God is telling a story for generations. In the book of Matthew, he starts with Abraham and the line that would come from Abraham. In the book of Mark, he starts with the prophecy in Isaiah that the Messiah would come. And then John goes back even further. 
you open up your Bible, the first page you see inevitably is Genesis 1-1, talking about God creating the heavens and the earth. But chronologically, actually, the first action that takes place is described in John 1-1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Come to find out in John chapter 1, that Word is Jesus. That Jesus has been here from the beginning. Right? by the side of the Father. This is not a backup plan, sending a Messiah. It's been his plan from the very beginning. So what are the implications of this text that we're looking at here this morning? Number one, we learn what God does with humility. We learn what God does with humility. Mary says in verse 48, For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. They will call me blessed. It's not because of her goodness. It's not because she was better than anyone else. It's because of God's choosing. It's because of God's doing. It's because of God's mercy. She sees herself being one of humble estate. She calls herself God's slave. And he takes that humility and he uses it for something bigger and better than her. And this is not a one-time thing. God does this throughout scripture. Takes our humble offering and he turns it into something bigger than us. And you know what? That didn't stop when the New Testament ended. It continues on to this day. If anything good comes from our life, if any fruit comes from our life, if our kids are faithful to the Lord, if our marriage is intact, if God uses these words that I am speaking this morning, it is him taking our humble offering and using it for something amazing. It's his power, it's his might, it's his mercy that takes our humble offering and does something with it. Number two, back to our poll from the beginning of the service. This verse is saying something about thinking and singing. Thinking and singing. For whatever reason, we often think that the music portion is the emotional part of the service. And some of us even think that the reason we don't want to raise our hands, the reason that we don't want to, like, sway or anything, is because we don't want to give over ourselves to emotionalism. We don't want it all to be just about emotions. We want to make sure we're thinking clearly and thinking soundly about our faith. First off, I don't think anyone in this church is ever going to be uh, accused of being given over to emotionalism in the service. We're, most of us are a few notches below emotionalism, so we can put that to rest. But Mary is showing us here that bursting out in song to the Lord is a deeply theological endeavor. New Testament scholar Leon Norris says that this song of Mary is a humble contemplation to the Lord's mercy. It is a humble contemplation. She is thinking about the mercy of the Lord and it is causing her to have an emotional response and the way she lets that out is in song. In fact, when she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, the tense of that word magnifies tells us that her soul keeps on magnifying the Lord. And when we read the word rejoice, I rejoice in God my Savior, that word rejoice actually means I rejoiced. So here's how the scripture goes. The passage goes from the very beginning of this song. I rejoiced in what God has done and I keep on magnifying the Lord. My soul keeps on pointing to what God has done because I rejoiced. I thought about what God has done. One commentator even said that it's possible that she is thinking about these things as she is walking to Elizabeth. Well, she was thinking about what the angel has said. She's thinking about the faithfulness of the Lord and she bursts out into song. Number three, this is the last thing I'm going to say about singing, I promise. Our singing should say something about who God is. If we are just singing as the warm-up band before the real band comes on and the sermon starts, or if we are just singing because people like music, 
Or if we are just singing because we have to ask the guy we're paying to lead music to actually do something once in a while, like, if those are the reasons that we're singing, then you're right, you can just skip it. You can play on your phone, you can sit down, you can come in when the sermon starts. That's not why we sing. We sing because it is a response to what God has done. And we want to say something about who God is in our singing. And so the guys on staff, Pastor Steve, Pastor Rodney, did you know Rodney is a pastor now? He doesn't just stand in the back row with nice shoes and play the bass. He's a pastor here. Those guys think long and hard, and so do all of our other music leaders. They think long and hard about the music that we play. And they try to avoid songs that talk about us or how God makes me feel. And they focus on who God is. We sing because of who God is. And some of us don't sing because we don't like to sing or we don't like the sound of our own voice or we come from a faith tradition where singing's not a big deal or singing is dry and we're just not used to it being a part of the service. Our preference and our tradition is uh, a lot that's wrapped up into this. I grew up in Kansas City, uh, where there's a lot more churches that come from kind of the charismatic wings uh, of, of Christianity. And so there was a lot more um, emotion mixed up in the service. There was a lot more music in the service. I played high school basketball, and I played for a Christian school that actually um, was in a church, and we would have to walk through the sanctuary to our locker room. And they would have, um, during the week, they would have prayer and praise nights. And we would walk through the service, and it was not uncommon to see someone running through the auditorium with a banner as music is being played and people are worshiping, sometimes for hours to the Lord. For some of us, we're like, I can't even imagine that. That is not where I came from at all. So some of this is based on preference and what we're used to and what we're comfortable with. But if we're honest, for some of us, we just don't know what all the fuss is about. And I submit to you that you may never lift your hands in this service, and you may never sing out so other people can hear you, and that's not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is if you have never had an emotional response to thinking about what God has done for you, then you may not have believed what you're thinking about. If we are thinking rightly about who God is, it will create an emotional response in us of some kind. And sometimes that's going to cause us a response to cause us to do something that we normally wouldn't do, like sing, or raise our hands, or sway, or just participate in some way. Mary can't help but sing. The psalmist can't help but sing because of what God has done for them. Lastly, what is your hope in? It is clear where Mary has placed her hope. She has placed her hope in God, her Savior. Her hope is not in her goodness. Her hope is not in being a good Jew. Her hope is not in her own piety. Her hope is not in her religious activities. Her hope is not even in what God just told her she's going to do. She's going to be the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. Her hope isn't even in that. Her hope is not in her mission or the calling that God has given her. Her hope is in God, her Savior, the one who is mighty, the one who is holy, the one who is merciful. Her hope is in God, her Savior, because God isn't just holy, he isn't just powerful, but he is merciful. And that Abrahamic covenant Now we have an opportunity to be included in that covenant that God made with Abraham and the Jewish people. He says, all nations through you will be blessed. All nations will have an opportunity to be grafted in, using the language of the New Testament and the Apostle Paul. We can be grafted in to the people and the family of God, not based on our bloodline, not based on what we have done, but because of Christ and what he has done for us. Because Christ didn't just come to teach about the kingdom or show us what the kingdom of God is like. He came to invite us in to his kingdom and then pay our way. Because you and I are disqualified for God's kingdom. Because we're not good enough. And we will never be good enough. 
I can never preach enough sermons and you can never hear enough sermons. I can never raise my hands high enough and neither can you in order to be made right with God. But Christ comes, God in the flesh, and he always does the will of the Father. Yet the very people he came to save put him on a cross. And on that cross, the ultimate act of humility, laying down his life for us, he takes on our sin and he gives us his righteous perfection. And so now when the Father sees us, he sees his Son, the righteous moral perfection of Christ. Is your hope in that today? Yes, for your eternal salvation, but is your hope in that today? Or is your hope in something else? You know how you can know? By the things you feel and the things you think about. Often, my hope is placed somewhere else, and so I'm disappointed, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm anxious, I worry, I fear, because my hope is placed somewhere else. What is your hope in today? There's only one place that Mary knew she could put her hope, and it's the same place that we have to put our hope. It's in what Christ has done for us. The band is going to come up, and we're going to close in a fitting fashion, singing about who Christ is, singing about what he has done for us. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to keep worshiping you. God, we recognize that worshiping you does not end when we leave this building, but it continues as we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to you. And God, the only way that we can be holy and pleasing to you is because of what Christ has done for us. Jesus, the Son of God. That is the one that we want to sing about now. That is the one that we want to worship now. God, we want to lift up in one voice from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people as a picture of your heavenly throne room. We want to lift up our praises to you now.